Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. The case that I'm going to be looking into today is the case of Mia Zapata. This was a suggested case so thank you very much for that. I appreciate any suggestions you guys have. I'd just like to let you know I mean no disrespect to anyone I talk about today. I've just gathered this information from the internet and compiled it into a video for educational purposes. Mia Catherine Zapada was born on the 25th of August 1965 in Louisville, Kentucky. She attended Presentation Academy High School and by the age of nine she had learned how to play the guitar and how to play the piano. She was really really heavily influenced by punk rock, jazz, the blues, R&B, all genres of music really but she was really really into music, she was really really into her instruments and things like that and she just really really loved it. In 1984 she enrolled in Antioch College at Yellow Springs in Ohio where she was a liberal arts student. Mia was actually from quite an affluent family but she would often go without sort of the luxuries in life of comforts and things like that. She would, she would just go without them a lot of the time. Her father actually said that she lived in two different worlds. On the one hand she had sort of her affluent family with tennis clubs and private schools and things like that. And then on kind of the other side, she had her music and it was as if nothing else mattered. The comforts that she was used to, she just left all them behind just to follow a dream. And they didn't really mean anything to her. Regardless of that, wherever she went, she commanded respect. And people were just really interested in her wherever she went. She was an active member in the community and she was said to just have this magnetic personality so people were just drawn to her all the time. Also, it was said that she could kind of had the ability to draw all different kinds of people together that maybe before wouldn't have ever thought that they would get on or wouldn't have ever spoken and then sort of Mia would just draw all them together and then they would build these relationships that you prob they probably wouldn't have done before. She was just such a vibrant and talented girl and she was described as being a very full funny and really, really intelligent. In September of 1986, Mia, along with three of her other friends, decided that they were going to start a band and they did. They started a band and they called it The Gits. Now, that band consisted of guitarist Andrew Kessler, drummer Stephen Moriarty and bassist Matt Dresner, obviously with Mia as the vocals. The band then decided that they were going to relocate to Seattle. At the time, Seattle's sort of music scene was bustling and it was they were really, really getting into all of that and rock and things like that and punk rock. And so they decided that that would be the best place for the band to go and so they, they moved. That's where they went. And it turned out it was going to be a really good move for them, actually. Mia got a job at a bar and they all moved into this abandoned house, which they called the Rat House. The band did really, really well. It was really well received and people really, really enjoyed the music. They had sort of, at some point, record people coming up to them, wanting to do tours with them and things like that. And they had the means to become quite successful. This band released singles from 1990 to 1991. And again, they did really well. People loved the music. They were really, really making a name for themselves. In 1992, the band released an, their album called French in the Bully. Their reputation increased as with the grunge scene in Seattle. The band began work on the second and what would be their final album called The Conquering Chicken and that was to be released in 1993. Mia always dreamed of becoming world famous. She had such a passion for music and she was a really good singer. People really, really loved her. It was on the 7th of July in 1993 when Mia had been at the Comet Tavern with a few of her friends, they'd been drinking, and that was in the Capitol Hill area of Seattle. Now at the time, Mia was staying at a studio space apartment, sort of in the basement, and that apartment building was only a block away from this bar. She went to see a friend who actually lived on one of the higher floors, and she left at around 2am stating that she would get a cab home. That was actually the last time she was seen alive. It's not really known what happened to her after that, whether she walked a few blocks to another friend's apartment or whether she decided to actually walk home or whether she did in fact try to get in a cab and she was picked up somewhere nobody really knows as i said 
that was the last time she was seen alive because Mia's body was discovered near the intersection of 24th Avenue South and South Washington Street and that was around 3.30 a.m. A woman passing by saw the body and she was really really close to a firehouse at the time so she decided that the best course of action would be to run to the firehouse and let them know where they could then contact the authorities which they did. Mia's body was actually found two miles away from the recording studio and about three miles away from the street where it was later found that witnesses had heard screams. She was found lying on her back with her right leg kind of over her left leg and she was in sort of a Christ-like position. She had a hood over her face, she had ligature marks around her neck and she still had like a tight sort of string tied around it. The police really, really believed that she was attacked sometime after 2.15 a.m. At the time though, Mia didn't actually have any identification on her, so nobody knew who she was. She was treated as a Jane Doe until she actually got into the medical examiner's office and this medical examiner was a fan. He knew who Mia was. He'd been to see the gits and he knew exactly who she was. Her band members would state how they would sit in a bar and they'd be looking around knowing that their really, really good friend had been murdered and it could have been anyone. Anyone sat around them, anyone they see in the street, literally they didn't have a clue. They could have been speaking to the person or even sat next to them. And it was a massive worry for them. Like this person was still out there and they needed to catch them. So the police began their investigation. They kind of felt like it had some sort of religious aspect to it as well as other psychopathic motives. And that just made the suspect list bigger really. They found scuff marks on the toes of her shoes and on her left hip. They found marks on her skin and her belt. There were also these metal fragments sort of strewn around the body, which was very strange. One foot away from her head was actually a tire mark residue. And it was really, really believed that Mia had actually been murdered somewhere else and her body dumped there. And this tire mark residue was, well, I say dumped, they believe she was posed. So this person would have dumped the body and then posed it and then sort of sped out of there, got out as quick as they could, with tires spinning, leaving this mark. So they didn't know whether this person knew her. I mean, Mia spent a lot of her time in the limelight. She was obviously a figure that a lot of people knew. So if somebody was stalking her or something like that, it would have put her more in the sights than say somebody else. But also it could have just been a random attack. It literally, they didn't really know very much information about it. A lot of people found it hard that she was actually strangled as well because that was her everything. She was a singer and she was so into her music and her vocal cords were everything to her. And this person, this monster who'd taken her life had also kind of ruined them as well in in sort of the sentimental sense obviously they took a life you know what i mean people just found it hard around her because that was her soul essentially her underwear was found in her pockets and it was made very very clear that she'd been sexually assaulted her bra had been ripped and there was a cut missing out of it now police thought that possibly this could have been taken as a souvenir it could have just been i don't know thrown out later on or something like that i'll be in the area but it was possible that this person did take it as a souvenir because a lot of people do that. Police didn't actually make it public that she'd been raped. They asked her friends to kind of keep it strum because they wanted to tie that in later. So if they ever got any leads or anything like that, a police do it quite often. They keep certain information under wraps so that the perp doesn't know that they have this information and then they sort of bring it in later on. So it's very, very common for them to do that and that is what they did in this case. Not only that, if they believed that this person had taken this souvenir, then if they found out that the police knew about it, then maybe they would throw it away. There were these red markings on her skin and they believed that they were bite marks. So they weren't deep enough to indent her skin to get a dental mold so that they could obviously compare it to dental records, but they thought they were definitely bite marks. They were kind of like scrapings and they were fresh. So they had most likely happened as she was being attacked. It was kind of realized very quickly that with all of that Mia had suffered, this person was trying to cause pain rather than actually satisfy himself. She'd been beaten quite badly along with being strangled. And the ME did actually say that if this perpetrator hadn't actually strangled her, she would have succumbed to her injuries. So her beating must have been 
really really bad and she must have suffered so much which is just awful to even think about. The autopsy found evidence of a struggle and that she'd suffered a blunt force impact to her abdomen and had a liver laceration. So the police really tried to get a timeline for Mia, they spoke to her friends around her, they took samples, forensics, went and scoured the areas to get any DNA or anything that they could. They also searched the area but they just found very very little really. And they also couldn't tie it in with anyone at the time. It's never actually been found where Mia was murdered. As I said, they truly believed that she was murdered somewhere else and obviously then dumped there. It was thought that it was someone close to her. A lot of the times in these cases, it is. It is the person that's closest to you. One of your friends, one of your families, your husband, your children. It could literally be anyone. But a lot of the time, it is someone that knows you rather than a complete stranger. But her friends were really cooperative. They all gave samples. They all sort of went to interviews and they just tried to help as best as they could. The suspect list was actually quite large. There were a lot of people that were known to be jealous of her fame and a lot of people also rang in with tips saying that this band was connected and this band were connected and a lot of them bands were her friends and they were sort of interviewed and things and they didn't seem to have anything to do with it so there was a lot of speculation around it and people blaming other bands and things like that. It was really really thought that this case would be solved fairly quickly however that was certainly not, not the case. It was profiled on America's Most Wanted. It was documented on a sh TV show called 48 Hours. It was on City Confidential and Forensic Files. Despite all of this and all of the investigation, all the tips, all the leads, all of everything, her case remained unsolved for many, many years. So in a bid to help sort of raise money to find me as killer, the Gits held several benefit concerts, which included several famous musicians, including Kurt Cobain and Joan Jett. Jet also went on to perform some of Mia's songs with the Gits for this special recording. Basically, they wanted to keep it all in the public eye. Yes, they wanted to raise money. They wanted to hire a private detective, really, but they just wanted to keep it in the public eye because as soon as things start to fade away and people aren't looking anymore, then that is often when they get forgotten about and, I don't know, nothing really comes in, nobody gets any leads and the cases go cold. So they just wanted to keep it fresh in everyone's mind. As I said, years passed and the case did begin to fade. That was when they did hire a private detective, private investigator. And along with the police again, they just looked at every avenue. There were kind of three main theories at the time as to what had happened to her, that she was murdered by a cab driver, that she was killed by someone while she was walking to her apartment, or that she was actually killed at the recording studio because the day actually after her murder, a friend went to this recording studio and found the Gits demo tape and Mia's personal microphone. And apparently she carried these everywhere she went. So that suggested that she might have been attacked there because why didn't she have these things on her when she carried them literally everywhere? You had really two sides of it. Some believed that she knew her killer and the other side believed that it was just a random act of violence. So the private investigator they hired was called Lee Huron, and she believed that Mia was killed by someone she knew. The police on the other hand believed that she was killed by somebody that didn't know her. There were a few suspects and things that were questioned as a result of these, and they did polygraphs and things like that, but none of them panned out, none of them were ever charged. There was never enough evidence. The polygraphs came back as saying that they were telling the truth. Whatever the reason behind it, None of these people were ever charged. The band at this point was running low on funds and Lee really, really, the private investigator, really wanted to carry on the case, but obviously it's her job and she needs to get paid. And so that was when they decided to gather everything together and the band took it to the Seattle police. They then took on the case, I guess because it was very, very public at the time and it was an unsolved case for years and they really, really wanted to get it solved. And it really meant so much to the community around her that they took it on. They focused on the swabs that had been taken from the bite marks and they were hoping for a DNA profile match with the advanced technology that they now had. As I said, this was years and years later, so they were hoping that with how much technology has advanced them days, that they could find something. And they did. They were able to get a DNA profile of a male suspect. So they put it into the DNA felony bank and they didn't find a match. That was when they submitted it to the national DNA bank 
to see if they got any matches across the nation. It was really thought that this was a suspect's DNA, but nothing matched in the databases. That was all they needed. They just needed a match. And it must have, it was so frustrating because they literally had the DNA of the person they truly believed to be their main suspect, and yet they weren't in any of the data banks or anything like that. And so they were just left in limbo in a sense. They did check it every week though. They, they checked it every week because obviously you might check one day and then the next day the perpetrator's DNA is entered. And then obviously you don't get the match because you've checked it the day before. So they checked it weekly. After a while, they got hit in Florida. They had a hit on a man named Jesus Mesquia and he was a fisherman from Florida. At this point, we are 10 years after Mia's murder. We are now in 2003 and Jesus was finally linked by DNA and so the police began to look into him. They found out a number of things. So firstly, they found out that they didn't believe that he actually knew Mia, that he, at the time of a murder, he lived just three blocks away from where her body was found. And where he actually lived was en route to the Comet Tavern. So it was very plausible that maybe on her journey home or something like that, she passed his house or she was very close to it. He also had a car, so he was mobile and he had a criminal history, a violent criminal history. He had been arrested for assault, battery of a spouse, robbery. It was a very good in indication that he was violent towards women. There was also a report of indecent exposure on file against him in Seattle within two weeks of Mia's murder. So that puts him in sort of the area at least two weeks before she was murdered. So the police went out to Florida and they initially couldn't find him. They pulled all the resources and eventually they found out that he was in Miami and they went to Miami and they arrested him. He was extradited to Washington for his trial. And when the trial ensued and this man came out, people were shocked by the sheer size of him. He was huge. And Mia wouldn't have actually stood a remote chance against him. Even if she knew self-defense or anything like that, this man was massive. There's just no way she wouldn't have stood a chance. She tried to fight back and he brutally beat her and she just succumbed to her injury. Well, she was strangled, but she would have succumbed to her injuries because he beat her that badly. And he was that huge. He must have had that much force in sort of behind his attack. She just wouldn't have been able to survive an attack off him. Now, as the trial continued, it was kind of difficult to prove beyond reasonable doubt that saliva is proof of first degree murder. Well, when the ME testified, they put forward all of this proof that the bite mark and the saliva left on the body was left at the time of her sexual assault and murder. It wasn't old, it wasn't done postnatal because that would just be weird. Even though people, I guess, do do stuff like that. Either way, it was proved that it was done at the time. Therefore, Jesus must have been a murderer. His teeth were on her chest at the same time she was being sexually assaulted, beaten, and then strangled. And therefore, he must have been the killer. The defense went on to say that it had been possibly transferred through her clothes, but I don't think that really flew too far. Jesus never testified in his own defense and still maintained his innocence. Still says that he's innocent. He was just a cold and emotionless man during this case and this trial, and he just showed no remorse for what he'd done at all. So as I said, we don't truly know what happened to Mia that day because he never admitted to actually doing it, but it's really believed that he saw Mia sort of as she left the bar and he followed her a short distance before he attacked her. Her headset would have been covering her ears, so she would have been unaware of any danger until he actually grabbed her and dragged her to his car. They believe that he assaulted her in his back seat, obviously beat her and things like that, and then strangled her and dumped her body. Where his car would have been at the time of all this happening, we don't know. Jesus was convicted of first degree murder of Mia Zapata and he was sentenced to 37 years in prison in 2004. He actually did appeal his sentence, which was then changed to 36 years in prison. And he has been in prison since January of 2003. This case was so tragic. Mia was this up and coming musician who really had so much potential to do some wonderful things. And it was her passion. It was what she dreamed of doing. She was so promising and she was only 27 years old. 
when she was brutally murdered by a total stranger. She wouldn't have ever been able to have children, start a family. Her life was just stolen away pointlessly and it's just so sad. I am glad that eventually it was solved though. It did take 10 years but with sort of the advancements in technology and putting it into the DNA bank and things like that, a lot more cases are being solved. So there's a lot of hope to hold out for these unsolved cold cases with DNA that maybe one day they will, will be solved like this one which is really, really good. The person that did this to Mia is at least serving the time in jail. I bet he believed that he would never be caught, truly. 10 years later, I bet he thought he got away with it for years, but thankfully, due to technology, he is now serving the time he should be. But yeah, that's the end of the case. If you guys have any suggestions, let me know. I'll look into them for you. Give me a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for similar content. Anyway guys, that's all I have today on the case of Mia Zapada. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, bye.